Welcome to a very special episode of Black and Asul. I'm Jamin Moore. With me, Joel Soria, uh, and with us, head coach of Reno 1868 FC, Ian Russell. Welcome to the show, Ian. Thanks for having me. We're going to be asking uh, Ian uh, plenty of questions about the Reno season, about uh, what's going on with the earthquakes right now, along with Reno and their preseason, and then we're going to at maybe get into some old time questions for, right. for old time's sake. So stick with us, and I think it's going to be a great episode. Okay, so Jamin and Joel again here with uh, Ian Russell. Ian, welcome. Uh, you're nowadays in Reno. You, yep. You've been in the Bay Area for a while before that. Um, and now you're coming to the area so th for preseason. Right. And, uh, and your Reno team, 1868 FC, where you're the head coach, are going to be joining the Earthquakes for a special set of practices. Now last year, the Quakes went up to your place okay. and they were fresh off of two weeks in Cancun and you handed them a 3-0 loss. It doesn't seem like uh, people wanted to do that again this year? Yeah, I think, um, like you said, I mean, for us it was it was pretty beneficial to have a tired team coming to Reno. We're at 5,000 feet elevation, so they were coming from Cancun where they just had pretty much triple days. They're very tired, they came in, and, and we were up for it. So uh, ended up 3-0, and I think uh, now they may want to pay us back in a couple of days here. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen over these next few days? Uh, yeah. This is this is a new thing. You haven't really done this in preseason where you've gotten together for several days like this before, have no. you? No. Um, so I think, um, first of all, we'll train tomorrow. Tomorrow's Sunday. Uh, we had a game today against Sac Republic. So tomorrow's just going to be regen, really light. And then um, we'll train Monday. I think Matias will come out. Um, hopefully he'll run the session. I would like that. Um, and then we play the Quakes on Tuesday. So it'll be an inner squad, sorry, not an inner squad, but the the format's not going to be just a 90-minute game. I think there's going to be four 40-minute periods or so. So we have some trialists in, and they've got some players that they want to see get some, some good time. So it's going to be a longer game, but excited to be down here for sure. Ian, thank you for joining us. Uh, you mentioned Matias Almeida. What can Ian Russell learn from someone like Matias Almeida? Yeah, definitely a lot. Um, you know, we've had probably five or six meetings already last starting last year on on his system how he plays his, his man marking um, it's all very interesting um, I think there were times last year watching the quakes where I thought they were going to win MLS Cup they had that run of things in June maybe July ish where they were they were phenomenal and um, you know going through I've edited a lot of video actually I was down here two weeks ago three weeks ago going through video with Matias on why did he do this there? Why didn't he do this there? Um, and I've learned a lot already. Um, we're implementing the same same system. So it, it's gonna take some practice for us, um, just like it did with San Jose the first first few games. Um, but obviously he's had success ever, everywhere he's gone and he'll continue to do that. And um, I'm just happy that he's kind of really opened up and, and kind of shown our staff, you know, what he wants to do, and we'll try to carry it on in Reno as well. Was your relationship with um, any other Quakes coach as intense as it's been with Matias thus far? I think, um, you know, the first year when I was in Reno, Dominic was the coach, Dominic Kinnear, and um, who I've known for a long time, obviously, he coached me in San Jose. Um, Dominic was a little more hands-off in terms of when players would come in, You'd say, hey, one or two guys are coming in. Do you want anybody else? Um, how is he playing? Is he is he not at the level? If he's not at the level, I'm not going to send him. It was more one of those. Uh, Michael Starry was kind of the same way. Um, if players weren't performing in Reno, I had a, a bit of a choice, you know, if I wanted that player to come. I think Matias is more, um, I want these players to play. Um, there, there will be conversations if, if they're not playing at the level. Those are always tough conversations to have, but um, I think he respects me as a coach to say, hey, I don't know if this player is ready to be coming to Reno. Um, but on the other hand, 
you know, if the player's doing really well in Reno, he's probably going to get a really good chance at, at getting some time with the first team. So I'd like to come back to that philosophical type question <laughs> mm-hmm. here in just a little bit. But first, going back to your 2019 season, you finished second place in the Western Conference and USL Championship, which was, I believe, the highest mark that the team has finished yeah. in a regular yep. season. And then you got to the playoffs uh, and you got a first round bye. Yep. and then had a home game, and for the second time in the last three years, you, you lost the home game. Right. How do you compartmentalize a, a season like that when it's done, when right. you had so much success in the regular season and then end such, in such a sudden fashion? Right, it's, uh, it's tough. You know, you think you're in a really good position, the work you've done in the season to get your home seed a, a bye, and then to lose in the first round is tough. Um, so it's, it's always going to be a learning process. Why did we not advance? Why did we advance the year before on, on the road? So you learn th- something as a coach, but I would say, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough one to swallow. The first year in 2017, and I don't like to make excuses, but we had some bad injuries. Three of my four forwards were injured, Brian Brown, Antoine <laughs> Hopenow, and Dane Kelly, right before our playoffs. And um, to date, I still feel like that was – the best team we've had in Reno um, and think with healthy bodies going in the playoffs we could have made a deep run um, the second year we won the first round lost in the second round but last year was interesting because it was kind of just a solid good year the whole time through it was not a lot of ups and downs it was just kind of consistently good we got to the playoffs had a really good I thought first half came out kind of flat in the second half to be honest um, made a mistake, got punished, and then he scored right after that, and it was three to one. And um, didn't look very dangerous, to be honest, in the second half. And, um, you know, as a coach, you're gonna always question, did I make the right substitutions? Um, One of our strikers, Danny Masofsky, had a bit of a groin issue, was debating on whether or not to, to even play him in the game, subbed him on, and he wasn't effective. He couldn't really move, I probably shouldn't have done that. Kevin Partita was cramping, and I didn't know this. I saw about Eric Cavillo. All of a sudden, Kevin Partita, two minutes late. Actually, when, when Eric's walking off the field, he goes, hey, Kevin needs a sub, he's cramping. Then I'm thinking, man, I would have just left. I would have just moved Eric to the six. No problems. And then I had to sub a defensive midfielder in when I need goals. It was just uh, the subbing pattern by me wasn't, wasn't great. Um, so you live and learn. Excited about the next year. Um, I think we have a pretty strong team, but... I think everybody thinks that in preseason. You got to see how the season goes. But um, like I said, as a coach, you just have to learn from from past experiences and reflect on them and see how to get better. Phoenix Rising last year had just an amazing right. season, right? Like they were practically unbeatable. But both of you lost, you know, in the playoffs right. ahead of the finals. Does that say more about you know the quality and the parity in USL Championship is improving, or do you think that? Hey, it's second division soccer. There are going to be a lot of like ups and downs where where people sometimes are not as consistent as they might be at yeah. the MLS level, which is a bigger factor. You yeah, think. I think that's a good point. I think um, if you look at the USL last year in the playoffs, a lot of the home teams lost. Um, you know, Phoenix actually went out. We went out early, um, and I think it's a lot of that is just uh, the players. Well, sometimes going on the road as a team, there's less pressure on the road, right? You're not in front of your home fans. You're not expected to actually do well on the road. Um, And I think sometimes at the USL level, a player's psyche may not be as strong as an MLS player's psyche. And at home, you're expected to win. And I think sometimes being mentally strong at home, letting the crowd actually really help you. And I think that sometimes players have a hard time with that. Not to say that's why we didn't win on at home, but I think uh, the pressure is a little bit higher. When you're going on the, the road, there's nothing to lose. Hey, we're not supposed to win this game. We're going in front of a hostile environment, and the players maybe sometimes relax. Maybe we're a little bit uptight at home. Um, Ian, you've been involved with the Quakes more or less for over a decade, right? Ever since right. 2008? Yeah, well... You, you've had some sort of affiliation yeah, with the club? since 2000, really. Since 2000? Yeah, and so it's, it's been a long time. Um, what what would you what's the one thing that you can point at that has developed the most since your time? I think um, the academy system, first of all, um, 
the academy, just everything's gotten a lot better. I mean, when we when I was playing, we were we didn't have a we didn't have a training site. We were going up to West Valley College, um, training at or playing games at Spartan Stadium. So I think just the overall infrastructure of first of all the MLS, but in San Jose, it's just leaps and bounds. They have their training site right there, the stadiums right there, academy. I think they're gonna at some point have a complex where the whole academy can be in one spot and but I just think the the ownership's putting putting good money into you know the infrastructure of the club on a coaching role you've been affiliated with the Quakes since 2008 yeah. though and that's what yeah. I was trying to refer to right. um, what, what's the one major progress that you've seen under the Almeida era thus far yeah well I think um just even before the Almeida era um, just everything like the scouting networks, um, you know, f before it was the assistant coaches were doing all the scouting, you know, the GM would do also do scouting, but now there's a designated chief scout, Bruno Costa. Um, so it just takes a lot of the pressure off the coaching staffs of having to, to wear so many hats. Um, with Matias, I think what he's done is he's trying to bring, you know, everything together. I think, um, he, I think he would like the academy to start playing his system. Um, he definitely wants the USL team to, to play play his way. Um, and I think just kind of centralizing everything where it's under one, one platform where when a player comes to Reno, we're playing the same system, so it's a, it's a really easy transition. In the last couple of years, I haven't, I played a different system. And um, I think we're getting that all under one umbrella. So coming back to that, you were you've been playing mainly a a four four two diamond, right? Right. Yep. And um, are you are you already telling the players, hey, we're going to be adopting this uh, this Matias system? And are you talking primarily on the defensive side with the man marking and and maybe keep more of your offensive philosophy? Or are you going to well looking yeah. at adopting pretty much really everything? good question? Um, so spoken with Matias a lot about 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 his system, and the main thing he said was. Every coach is going to do a little bit differently attacking-wise. Um, but I would really like you to adopt more of this man-to-man, -man, man marking system. So he's given me some freedom on on how I want to attack. You know, he likes to play with wingers um, very wide, which is, you know, that's what he likes. He likes isolation, one-on-one -on -one battles wide. Attacking-wise, I like to invert my wingers a little more. Um, there's no right or wrong there, and I think he's okay with that. But defensively, we are, you know, we've been working on a lot of the the man-to-man -man stuff in preseason. Last year, um, we dabbled with it a little bit, and he, uh, I think he was happy about that. Um, but after a while, he's just like, hey, let's get a preseason where you can just fully focus on it. Don't worry about it doing it in the middle of the season like I was doing last year. Um, so we've been, you know, mainly working on it this preseason and did had a good result against Sac Republic. At least the first 60 minutes with our first team, we got a 0-0 draw. Um, and it was the first time really going all in with the, with, with the system. So I was pretty pleased. Now, we are playing San Jose on Tuesday against the team that, you know, that has been doing this for a long time, a year at least, with the coach that's been doing it for a long time. So... Let's, I don't, <laughs> the result may not be as good as it was today, but we'll see. So he has Espinosa and Vaco, so obviously yeah. that makes sense as to why he'd want to attack from the winger side. Right. Your strength has really kind of been more in the forward position and a bit at the 10 as well. Right. Mm -hmm. You've, uh, you've over three years had the, had accumulated the most goals in yeah. the USL championship. You know, to what do you kind of owe <laughs> that particular success? What is it that, that particularly forwards, I think, uh, find in your particular system of attack that makes them so successful? Yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, a lot of teams don't play with two forwards anymore. Um, right. And I'm not sure why a lot of teams have gotten away from that. I think they, they like to overload the middle with, you know, at least have three in there and drop their 10 in. But um, we, we were still able to do that with the diamond because we invert our, our wide players and have a, a 10 and a six, so you actually have four in there. Plus, you still have your two strikers. So it's it's a very uh, attacking oriented system, possession based, but still with two forwards. And I always uh, 
you know, we do a lot of pattern play, a lot of functional training to goal where, you know, every player knows their role and kind of in this situation, hey, what run should be happening? Always trying to get three players in the box. Um, and, I, you know, looking for kind of proven goals. I won't say proven goal scorers, but, you know, we've, we've brought in some guys that have had success scoring goals. And for some reason, when they've, they've come to Reno, they've had career years. Corey Herzog, Dane Kelly, um, Brian Brown, Danny Masofsky last year, um, Antoine Hopeno. So a lot of guys have kind of found a good niche there. Um, and we do attack. I mean, we, we send a lot of guys forward. Um, we try to get our number 10 involved. We have the two forwards. We try to get at least one of the inverted players high up the pitch. So, you know, sometimes there's four guys, you know, four or five guys attacking. And um, once we're in that zone, we try to pin teams in. Don't let them come out and recirculate and go again. And I just think we try to create a lot of chances and still try to be stabilized uh, defensively so we don't get countered on. But um, I, I like to attack. I want to run. I want guys that want to work and um we just that's that's what we try to do. Ian, who who would you say influenced your coaching methodology the most? I would say uh, probably Jason Christ. Um, pretty good story. Um, now listen, not to say that the coaches I worked under didn't. I I think I've taken a lot from from Frank, from Frank Gallup, Dominic, Mark Watson defensively. Um, but what really stuck out in my mind. Um, I used to work with the basically the, the team, the reserve team that was going to play. Well, I would set them up in the system that the other team was going to play. So our first team would would play against us. So all the guys that weren't playing, we were playing RSL. And um, so I set them up. I watched a bunch of um, RSL's games where they were playing the diamond. They did it really well. You know, this is probably 2010. Set up the team. We're going against our first team. And um, it was just like the light bulb kind of went off with me. Like we had possession. We still had pace up front where we can get in behind. The inverted players were making in to out runs behind the defense. And I'm just like, man, why aren't we doing this? You know, and I just saw that that RSL team just dominate the league. I thought for three or four years they were just so possession oriented. But they still had, you know, they had Robbie Finley, Yuri Masissian up front, Sabarillo. They were still getting in behind where it wasn't just they're just keeping it to keeping it they were dangerous so i think jason christ was a big influence um just in terms of how he how we played that system you know obviously i've had some really good coaches to work under um dominic and frank were were two and then obviously mark watson uh, i think i've taken a lot from from all of them um frank you know obviously coached me early on asked me to be his assistant in 2008 Frank really is a good manager of players. Um, he's definitely a coach's coach, or player, sorry, a player's coach. Um, has a really good way of, like Frank can tell you you're not starting and you're actually okay with it. You're like, he's such a, he's a good, very nice guy, so he has a really good way of, of managing players. Tactically really good as well in terms of, um, you know, Frank had his, had his way of play. You know, he'd play a 4-4-2, but everybody knew their role within that. Um, so I've taken a lot, lot from him. I, I obviously play a four four two a little bit differently with inverted wingers, but um, Dominic, I think, learned a ton from Dominic as well. Um, just the way he ran a practice, he really drives it. Um, very, very detailed, extremely detailed, and um, can just push a practice. If you watch him coach, he's 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 a very hands on coach. I think when I was an assistant coach with Dominic. Um, he likes to do it. He likes to manage, you know, I think a assistant with Frank is different. I got to run a lot of sessions. Dominic was more like I'm running the session. You guys are watching, have some input, but Dominic was hands on. I think, uh, I took a lot from him in terms of how he, how he prepared and ran his sessions. Mark Watson, another one detail oriented, especially on the defensive side. Um, excellent in terms of defensive shape, spacing, he will be like, hey, you need to be literally a half step here. You guys are too deep, three and a half yards to, to the tee. Like, he wants it like that. And I think um, his organization detail. But the person that really influenced me the most on just the terms of football, how I want to play, was is Jason Christ. 
Is there yeah. anyone outside of um, the American sphere that you admire? Um, someone maybe some an international name, perhaps. You know, you know who I, I really like uh, Brendan Rodgers. To be honest, I think he's uh, every team. I mean, he he didn't have great success um, the year with Liverpool. You know, um, but I think he was. I don't know. Just watching what he does with teams and the way they play, um, he always has good teams. They do well. They play good football. Um, I think he's been a manager that I've really, really followed and liked. So, so I like to talk a little bit about you know the earthquakes, homegrown players, and, mm -hmm. and some of the players that you've you've gotten from from the quakes in the past year or so. Um, it does feel like. You had six, I believe, Earthquakes players that were available for your playoff roster, which meant they had played at least five games with Reno last yep, season. Yeah, you got to play five games to be eligible. Which I think that was the most. Yeah. So clearly, you know, whether it's more Matias asking or mm -hmm. whether it's they're growing as players, mm -hmm. maybe a combination of both. What did you What did you think happened in the past uh, year since we talked last in terms of the growth of of the the homegrown players and some of the other Quakes players? Yeah, I think you, um, you know. You've got Gilbert, um, obviously uh, Jacob, Cade are the three main homegrowns that have been kind of coming through at a, at a regular basis. Now, Cade only played a couple games, um, but Gilbert's gotten quite a few games now. Jacob's gotten at least five or six. Um, they're going to continue to grow as players. I've seen uh, since Gilbert first started coming till now, he's, he's really, you know, he, he actually looks like a man now. He's, he's, he's solid. He's... He's getting quicker, stronger. He's always been a good footballer. There's no denying that. It was always, um, is he going to be able to handle the the physicalities of, especially MLS? You know, as we know, it's it's not an easy league. And I think the more games he can get um, in USL, and his, if he excels in USL, then he's going to get some some time with the first team. Um, obviously, until he does that in USL, he he probably won't get get much time there. Uh, same with Jacob. Um, Jacob physically very quick pretty good feet um, he's going to keep on developing with Cade Cowell you know you can see right away when you when you see Cade um, uh, he's a specimen at I think he's what 16 now yeah 16 <laughs> one of the fastest you know already one of the faster players on on the Quakes and, and Reno at 16 years old um, it's powerful strong looks to get in behind um Cade's gonna he has a really really good chance I think um he's gonna learn all the nuances of of the game right and that's the experience that that's you got to play games for that but you know being his age and his profile right now is, is pretty exciting you mentioned Cade and and obviously you're speaking wonders of him yeah is he out of all of the homegrown players that you've seen have the biggest upside um, I think they're all they all have good upside. Um, Gilbert technically is is excellent, you know, um, and he continues to develop well. Jacob, he's getting called in the U twenties now. Um, I think this year for Jacob could be a really breakout season for him. I haven't seen Casey Walls much, so I, I can't really comment on on Casey. I haven't I haven't had him, um, but the limited time I've worked with with Cade. Um, it's pretty exciting. I'll, I'll put it that way. I know he scored a bunch of goals throughout his youth career. Um, I don't know how, his, how, he, how he's producing right now with his if they if he's getting academy games. I haven't followed that, but um, the one thing I liked about Katie, he, he doesn't have any fear. Um, there were times when he's playing in USL games, he's faced up with a, a left back, maybe he's drifted out wide and. He's taking the guy on, and he's, he's going by him and getting a cross in. And at 15, or he was 15 when he was doing this. So that, like I said, that was exciting. So you're talking about the, the Quakes' younger players and their homegrowns and the, the players that you get. So coming back to this, this time that you have over the next couple of days with the Earthquakes, um, how do you come in and approach that particular scenario given that there are going to be players who are playing on the quake side that you're going to have during the season mm -hmm. and you have players on your side that are hoping to be noticed by the earthquakes do you just try to 
take the whole thing in and try to look at everyone in the same way, going that all, any of them could be playing in Reno this season, or are you more focused on what Reno's doing in these couple days? Yeah, um, so kind of both. Um, obviously, when you're putting the team together, when I'm putting the Reno team together, I'm, I'm trying to think who may I be getting from, from San Jose? Because what I don't want, I've had this happen before, where I've got too many players at one position. The Quakes send me a couple of sixes or eights. I've already got three, and I'm like, man, I, I feel really bad for the players that I've signed that are good players they're probably not going to play. It's tough to do that because injuries happen. Um, players are out of form. So you don't really know who you're going to get. So I actually have to build the team, assuming I'm actually not going to get anybody. And then I'll have to make the, the tough decisions or tell the players, hey, you may not be playing. Um, but when we play the Quakes, obviously I'm going to be looking at the players that I think I'm probably going to be getting and see how they're playing. Um, but definitely focused on making sure that Reno has a good showing. I, I want my players to do really well in front of Matias, you know, um, I think we have some players that, that can make the next next step, and I just I really hope they play well, um, and I hope the players that come from San Jose when they come to Reno that they really excel. I don't want them just to come and just be there. I want them to be some of the best players on our team because I, as a coach, need to see that. Matias needs to see that. The players on Reno need to see that. Um, if they're just coming and they're they're just okay, they're average. That that's a problem. You know, they've got to really stick out. And um, for the most part, they do pretty well. Ian, I would like to go to a quick A or B dynamic. Feel okay. free to elaborate if you'd like. All right. Um, so my first one, uh, the 2001 MLS Cup or yeah. 2003? 2000, or do I just say A? Or you, no, you can respond with, okay. the, with the name. Uh, 2001, uh, I played... I played a lot in that one. 2003, I came in as a sub, so that was my favorite one. As a Quakes, it's it's obviously sweeter to beat the Galaxy as well, I imagine. Of course. Oh, absolutely. What do you remember from that, that, that um, match? I remember uh, the biggest thing from that. Actually, the, the what I really remember is about five minutes in the game, I'm thinking, man, we're playing an MLS Cup right now. And it was kind of a weird, <laughs> I'm like, we're in MLS Cup, and we need to win the game. It was... I was actually like, my biggest fear was to make it to MLS Cup and not win the game. So I was like, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I help the team win. And then obviously D Rose goal in overtime was, that was it, man. Just remember that going in and I was like, man, we just won MLS Cup. It's amazing. First time we've had an MLS Cup winner on the show. Yeah, first time. Nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Second, um, Yallop or Kinnear? Oh man, I I mean, I, w I will say this, I've learned a lot from both of them. Um, I think man, actually, I, I can't answer that one because it, they're, they're both very good. Um, they both have great qualities, both great coaches. Landon Donovan or Chris Wondolowski? <laughs> <laughs> Killing me here. Um, <laughs> Man, I think uh, again. I think overall, like Landon's. You got to give me one on this one. Okay, yeah. I mean, please. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, I got to go with Chris on this one, and and the reason being, um, just I like his story. I like where Chris came from in terms of battling through the reserve league grinding it out, um, going to Houston, still not being a starter, comes back to San Jose with a trade with Cam Weaver, comes to San Jose, not a starter, gets his chance, and the rest is history. And he's a guy that, like, he'll fight to the end. Like, there's no quit in, in, in Wando. And, um, Man, the, just the extra work he did, and not to say Land, Landon did it too, but Wando, there were times where I'm telling Wando, hey, we got to go in. Like, you know, I'm serving him balls or he's finishing, and he's almost yelling at me, like wanting to fight me. Like, no, I'm not going in. I'm like, Landon, we got a game, to, or, or Chris, we got a game tomorrow. 
hold on a couple more and it's just that's his drive you know and every young striker needs to needs to watch what he's done because uh just his his he's perfected his craft and it's it's pretty amazing how do you think he would do as a coach chris i think i think he would do pretty well actually i think uh he sees the game he knows the game he knows what he wants he's pretty intense um I think he'd make a good coach. Has he reached out to you in regards um, to that? No, not Maybe really. Maybe he can't speak about that. Yeah, no, he <laughs> has not. Um, but he's he know he does know the game. I'll t- I'll say that. And if he's if you're coaching Wando, and he doesn't think the tactics are right, believe me, he's looking over at the side. At least he did with with our staff. He's looking over and doing. Hey, this is you know he's shaking his head. And, that's just how he is. What a great duo Ian and Chris would be. <laughs> <laughs> that could be interesting. Did you have more there? No, that's that's it. Yeah, th- those were tough. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would say all the coaches that I worked under, like Dominic Frank or played under, um, I've learned a lot from all of them. Um, there are some things I didn't like, some things I really did, um, but um, good questions for sure. <laughs> I want to get a little bit more on the Landon topic. So Landon's now come into USL Championship with the San Diego Loyal. Last year you had coaching against Eric Winalda mm-hmm. to look forward to. This year you've got Landon Donovan to look forward to. Have you really thought about that at all and uh, well, kind of what that's going to be like? Yeah, I mean, Landon called me <laughs> right when he, well, before he got the job um, and picked my brain a lot. I didn't want to give him too much because I think he's <laughs> going to be a good coach. Um, but I do like him, so I, you know, I just said, hey, try this, because he was kind of the GM. He's kind of the GM too, right. so I was kind of, and I'm kind of the GM up in Reno. I've, I you pick most of the players, so do the budgets and all that. Um, so with Landon, um, I just said, hey, you need to have, you need to have an idea of what how you want to coach, and um, you know the word philosophy. Everybody uses that, right? But you do have to have an idea of what you want, how you how you want your team to play, and go get those players that can that can fit that. Just don't get a player because you think he's a good player. Make sure he he's going to fit the way you want to play. Um, so we had talked a long time. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm sure he'll do well. You know, Landon's a competitive person. Um, he did say if he doesn't do well, he's going to fire himself. Basically, he's going to. Oh. I don't know. He just said, "Hey, if I'm not good enough, I'm out." Um, cause he's kind of the G I don't know exactly if he can fire himself or who can, <laughs> but, um, he made it pretty clear that if he's not good enough, he's, he's going to step down, but I'm sure he'll do well. Last year, you got that chance against Eric Winalda. You won the silver state cup. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's the Nevada trophy, I guess. Yeah. Um, did you have any conversations with him after that where you had the opportunity to to well, rub it in at all? Not really. Eric was, he was pretty complimentary, actually. Um, we played, I think the game we played down there, we played one of our better games, um, controlled the tempo, scored some goals. Actually, Haji scored that game, got a go- his first goal. Um, but Eric and I have always had a good relationship. Um, I like him. I want him to do well, just not against us. Um, <laughs> but he's been, Eric's a good guy. He's He's been complimentary about how we play and what we've done up in Reno. You know, obviously, preseason, the optimism levels are at an all-time high. Realistically, though, your gut tells you that Reno is going to do what in 2020? Um, yeah, I think every team thinks they're going to make the playoffs in preseason, whether it's MLS or USL. Um, I think our team is going to have a different look this year. Um, like I said, we've always played the diamond, you know, um, always had really good possession, been dangerous. Not to say we're not going to be. I think we will. It's just going to look a little bit different. I think you're going to see more, maybe maybe more wing play from us, um, more more mirroring kind of what Matias is doing for sure defensively. Um, I think we'll make the playoffs. Um, there's going to be some bumps, I think, uh, learning this system. I can't, you know, I'm not that naive to think we're going to just roll away with this thing run away with it but I think we have a good team I need the players from San Jose to come and, and be really good as well for us to really compete they've got to really come into the team and and show why they're MLS players and I think they will 
Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining us today on Black and a Soul. Yeah. Uh, fans, thank you for tuning in. And of course, our first episode of the season will be happening coming up here in just a couple of weeks, right before the season opener. So stay tuned for announcements about that episode. Of course, we will try to have the entire gang in studio for it. Ian, again, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Ian. Thanks, guys. Real pleasure. And uh, good luck this season. Appreciate it.